Um, so uh, I, I've been doing anti-rape activism for over two decades and understood that you had to start dealing with race because all the web, the, the oppression is a web and everything is tied together and if you want to stop one thing, you really have to be involved in all of it uh, or at least aware of all of it on, on some level. Um, and so one of the things that has been really curious about me is that um, I've come to understand that uh, being a racist is, as Karen says, you know, the worst thing you can possibly be told. But it turns out that there's so much uh, that we soak up as children uh, about uh, how races are supposed to be, it would be almost impossible to come out of this thing clean. Like, if you uh, uh, look at Kiri Davis, K-I-R-I, -I, on YouTube, she did a, uh, a, a doll test to reproduce, uh, maybe, uh, and, and Kenneth Clark's doll test from 1940s in which, you know, five, seven-year-old African-American children were asked whether they wanted the white doll or they liked the black doll, and, you know, some 70 to 80 percent of them chose the white, the white doll rather than the black doll. And, you know, so she reproduced this a few years ago. And uh, so you might ask, well, so black kids in this country are picking up those same messages. I wonder what the white kids pick up. Well, last uh, May on Anderson Cooper, you can again go on the web and find this show. They did the same thing with white kids. And what they found was, you know, four schools in New York, four schools in uh, South Carolina, I think it was, 133 students. 66% of the white children uh, said that the darker colored skin tone people are worse, uh, are less liked, are stupider. And, you know, 76% in some of the cases. And so, you know, five-year-old, seven-year-old white kids today are picking up these messages. And so the, the, the question really is, you know, does that fade as we get old? Am I now cured because I've done all this activism all my life and I should be, you know, tuning my horn as, as fixed? And uh, the answer to that comes out of a story of mine, which is I was facilitating an interracial dialogue group a couple of years ago. They wanted a white person to do the white privilege bit, so I went out for that one session. And as we were talking, one of the Latinos in the room talked about a book he was reading in French. And I had this very interesting ha thing happen. I said, French? But he's Latino. <laughs> and then a microsecond after that, I said to myself, oh, well, he has to be bilingual to get along in this country, so the English and the Spanish don't count. And then the third thing was, you know, what the bleep is going on? Because I've never had a conversation with myself about multilinguality. You know, I've never had a conversation with, with myself about why, you know, reasons why uh, Latinos should or should not know French. I should have thought, wow, that's great, he knows French. You know, I wish I had taken that night. <laughs> but that's not where my brain went. My brain went to, huh. You know, and so it was a very interesting experience. And um, so the next thing, of course, that you have to ask is, how many languages do I know? Let's take a poll. How many think I know six languages? Raise your hand. <laughs> how many of you think I know one language? Raise your hand. <laughs> Smart people. So what you see is a man who knows one language willing to sit in judgment of a man who knows three languages, or maybe only two that count. That is, what? That is the consciousness of white supremacy. To, be, to know less and sit in judgment of someone who knows more. So if you want to see a white supremacist, don't look any farther than this. This is what one looks like. Now, how could somebody actually tell you something like, like that about themselves? You know, and not hang his head in shame? Well, the reason I don't hang my head in shame or feel guilty about having picked up on these messages from childhood on is I didn't ask for them. I didn't voluntarily open up my brain and say, I want to take on all these really good racist messages. They just filter in through the media, through police, through parents, through ministers, through everything in my life. And no matter how hard I work to get rid of them, they're still going to be there and I'm going to still have to work on them. So my message to you all is, no, I'm not going to call you a racist because, you know, some of you are going to be uncomfortable with, with that. I want to invite you to the point of view that maybe we have picked up on these messages. And being conscious of that is so key to understanding how we can work as allies with people of color. Because if I'm coming into the room thinking I'm one of the good ones and point my finger at some of these other uh, white folks who just haven't quite got it yet, 
Um, you know, I'm not doing my white allies any service, and I'm certainly not doing my uh, friends of color any service. I need to acknowledge the reality that this stuff is here, it's going to come out, and hopefully what I can do is, you know, be behind the beat a fraction of a second and say, where the heck did that come from? Um, and uh, I think in that way I'll be a better ally to people of color. <laughs>